Welcome back to Just Chat. And this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings just for our own entertainment. Yes. And we've got some company with us here. Now, Audie's been shunning us for a while. Well, shunning me because the weather hasn't been good. And as you all know, he blames me for that. So I had to pay. Now, let me see if I can. Can you see that white whisker? My little boy seems to be getting a bit old. Nice white whisker in the middle of his face. All right. Do you want to let people see you? Yeah. Can I put you down now? Can I just... Oh, how nice was that? Well, today I thought we would continue to take advantage of the opportunity we have now that Nutmeg is being quiet, temporarily, to do more deep dives instead of just responding to whatever she's throwing out to the media, we have the opportunity to take a closer look at some, well, frankly, more important issues, because I can't imagine that the most important thing we could ever be looking at is where she and the sock puppet have wandered off for their date night. So, when we come back, we are going to take a look. Three things. And I will explain it when we come back. But they are, just for a little heads up, the three ways in which I think Nutmeg has some common ground with the late Princess Diana. So, when we come back. So, Nutmeg and Diana. Well, apparently, the only person on the planet who really thinks those two women have a lot in common is the sock puppet. And that occupied an enormous amount of ink in his magnum opus, well, all about how Nutmeg is just practically the reincarnation of his mother, although she can't be because his mother's not dead. I'll be honest with you. I had a very, very hard time following this. Yes, his wife, his mother, his mother's not dead. His wife is kneeling at his not dead mother's grave. His not dead mother is summoning leopards from beyond the veil. Uh, the man's epistemology is just... I'm. It's like a jar of marbles, and somebody just shook them up a little too much. Nevertheless, we are going to talk about this because I believe there is some common ground that is shared by Nutmeg and the late Princess of Wales. Uh, but it's probably not what the sock puppet would think, and probably not what Nutmeg herself would think. So let's get into it. Number one, and I, I, I have to start with this because it is the biggest thing. It is the overwhelming uh, similarity. And it's the one that makes all other similarities kind of fall into place. As we are dealing with two women who had serious, had have serious mental health issues. Now we're going to start with Diana. Diana was damaged. There's no question about it. Diana knew she was damaged. She, at points in her life, structured uh, everything around this damage, including uh, things like eating until she vomited, um, hurting herself, all of these cries for attention, because she knew she was in trouble. She got it. She absolutely understood that there was something not quite right. 
Now, she did not believe that she was mentally unstable, unbalanced, the way, uh, apparently, according to Diana, the palace believed she was, but she knew there were issues. She knew she was extremely unhappy, and she knew she was not coping well. Nutmeg, on the other hand, very clearly has mental health issues. And frankly, you can tune into YouTube at any given moment, any minute of the day or night, and find half a dozen brand new videos cropping up in the previous 10 minutes alone detailing our versions of Nutmeg's mental health issues. I have heard everything from sociopathy to narcissism. Narcissism is the most common. You all know I do not believe she is a narcissist. I don't. I have stated from the beginning that I believe she suffers from histrionic personality disorder, which is it looks a lot like narcissism. They're more than first cousins. They're like twin sisters, but they're not the same. So I'm holding out for histrionic personality disorder, but there's no question that there are mental health issues involved for both women. But unlike Diana, who knew she was damaged who was desperate and crying out for help in every way she could. Nutmeg is convinced that she is like your know, last sane person on the earth, that she's fine and the rest of us are crazy because we're not falling into line with her way of thinking. So, yes, strong similarity, but it's also a major difference. Uh, it's one of the things that makes it easier for most of us to relate to what was going on for Diana. Diana's problems stemmed from a, a very difficult childhood, a bad divorce, uh, from her parents' bad divorce, a split family. Nutmeg's background was relatively similar, only her family's divorce, her parents' divorce, was not rancorous. It was a civil, uh, amicable divorce in which her parents continued not only to see each other and peacefully share custody for some small period of time. You know, there was a long period of time when Doria was not in her life. It's been variously reported as uh, anywhere from 8 to 11 years. I'm just going to say 10 for the sake of argument. So we've got this like decade long gap when Doria was not present. But when Doria was around, it wasn't just uh, going to one another's houses for holiday dinners. They took vacations together. So not the rancorous divorce Diana was subjected to. And of course, Diana's parents' divorce was very damaging for her. Also, in the Bashir interview, the Panorama interview, Diana said that she was suffering from postpartum depression. Now, uh, I see no reason to doubt that. This is, I, I guess, what in the courts would be called a statement against interest. On one hand, in that interview, Diana was attempting to stress the point that she was not crazy, she was not unstable, she was not unbalanced, while at the same time explaining that, yes, she had bulimia. She absolutely suffered from a very serious eating disorder. She made statements that made it clear that she had the body dysmorphia that goes along with eating disorders. And then, of course, she was open about the postpartum depression. So I would have to say, yes, when a woman is trying to convince me she is not crazy and says, I had postpartum depression, I'm very much inclined to believe her because that is not ordinarily the sort of statement a woman would make 
if she wants you to believe that she is as sane as a sunrise. No. So, do I believe that? Yes. We do know from statements made by her family, including her brother Carlos, and this is toward the end of Diana's life, that she was unstable and she was paranoid. So, we know the issues were there. With nutmeg, no. There is no admission. There is no reaching out for help. There is nothing like that. Uh, she is fine. Everybody else just needs to fall in line with her. It's very different. And in fact, the only point at which nutmeg was claiming any degree of mental illness at all was when she claimed she wanted to you know, snuff her own candle, as they say. And I have to be careful about how I phrase that, which, in fact, I have said from the beginning, I simply do not accept the reality of that. I believe that was merely another of her ploys to link herself with the late Princess of Wales, who was deeply troubled while she was pregnant. So, that's number one. So, number two. This is their relationship with the media. And their relationship with the media has a lot of common threads. Uh, Diana was well known for notifying the press and uh, pop calls, basically. The same thing that Nutmeg does whenever she wants her picture on the front pages. And But once again, we have differences. And the differences, once again, fall to Diana's favor. When Diana would feel threatened, emotionally threatened, if she and Charles were not getting on well, she would make some paparazzi calls. She would do this in part to remind Charles that he couldn't just lock her away in the attic or confine her to an institution and as I mentioned on point number one, Diana had become paranoid toward the end of her life. And certainly at some point, she honestly believed that Charles, the royal family, or the men in gray were trying to have her committed, that they were going to make a case that she was not competent and have her put in a nice quiet little sanitarium. She also believed they were going to try to take her children away from her. This is extremely unfortunate. And when we look at this, you know, we see a very, very troubled, vulnerable young woman who was in her own mind fighting for her survival. She would get into a snit with Charles. She would call the media. She would make sure that Charles, the royal family, and all the men in gray were reminded in a very tangible way that she could not be locked in the attic or shoved in an institution, that she would be missed by the public. She would also call the press when she was feeling low, when she was feeling worthless, incompetent, uh, Fat, that was a big one because remember, body dysmorphia, she believed she was fat. Even when she was quite thin, that was the mental image in her head. She believed she was not good enough, that she was, she was drowning in the role of Princess of Wales. And sometimes she would just make a phone call in order to get that that feedback from the people. Uh, she used that to, to heal herself. And that's how she described it, that the affection of the people would console her. Uh, her marriage was in a shambles. Um, you know, she, she had a lot going on in her life, a lot of reasons driving her to seek that consolation. 
and she would reach out for it. That was another reason that she would make the pop calls. But even though it's very easy to look at, at a, a very insecure, very troubled young woman and see why she was doing these things because she's open about it. She has been, she has been very much an open book and express this. Oh, she expressed this without disguise, especially in the Panorama interview when she, and she talked about that. By the way, I have a link to the transcript of that interview in the video notes below. Now you can see that it's online. I believe Amazon it has the rights to it now, but the transcript is available for free. Just, you know, follow the link and you'll be able to read it yourself. Extremely open about it. Uh, at that point in her life, she was trying desperately to heal, to become more of a competent, functioning individual. It's very easy when someone is that open, that candid, and that forthcoming with their own inadequacies to say, yeah, I get it, poor you. And I'm not sure that was the point of the interview. Diana didn't tend to elicit pity from people. I think in this interview, she was simply trying to tell her story, to get it out there so that people understood. I think that's all it was. And certainly anyone who saw the interview would have to admit she was very candid. And the fact is, Diana, Diana did not have the skill for a lot of artifice. Not to say she didn't have enough skill to manipulate when she needed to, but the kind of high level skill it would take to turn uh, an interview like the Panorama interview into her own version of a narrative and manipulate everyone into accepting it at face value. No, I don't believe she had the skill for that. I think this is one of those cases where what you see is what you get. A troubled woman expressing herself. So the fact is that these are the reasons we can look at what Diana was doing with some sympathy, with some compassion. She was struggling and she was reaching out. Sometimes she would reach out to the media for consolation. Sometimes she would reach out to the media in order to remind her husband, his family, the, the firm, uh, that she was a woman who enjoyed popular acclaim and they couldn't shunt her aside easily. Nutmeg, on the other hand, has a much less complex agenda. When Nutmeg calls the press, it's because she wants her picture in the paper. It's just that simple. It's pure Hollywood. It is pure ego gratification. She wants to be on the front page. Why? She doesn't feel she needs to vindicate herself or justify herself, even though she does this all the time. It's not like, and it's not like she acknowledges this. For her, it's just the superficial. She wants to be in the papers. And I believe it was from Lady Colin Campbell's book. And I I have the book, in fact, I have the book sitting on the arm of the chair behind me. I believe it was Lady Colin Campbell's book I got this from, where she has allegedly instructed her public relations people, when she wasn't doing it herself, to make sure they got her face in the press at least three times a week. She wanted at least three stories a week. Um, and I think that was the number. It could be more. So we have 
two women engaging in the same behaviors, you know, telling the press, come, 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 go, 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 and manipulating the media for their own ends. But their own ends are very different. Their own motivations, utterly different. Still, it's a similarity. Once again, it's the same, but it's different. So that was number two. Number three, and I think this is probably the most interesting, they both believed that the firm, as Nutmeg would call it, the men in gray, as Diana would call it, were their enemies. The, the palace staff, the mechanism that protects the royal family, they both believed that these people would protect all of the other royals ahead of them. Diana believed the men in gray were out to get her. They were conspiring against her. They just wanted to do whatever Charles wanted to heck with her. Nutmeg actually said in her docudrama that she wasn't just thrown to the wolves, she was fed to the wolves. Interestingly enough, now that's, that's not where the similarity ends. Yes, they both believe that the palace staff was out to get them. Neither one of them ever acknowledged the many, many ways in which the same palace staff had protected them. Uh, the fact is that the palace staff, the mechanism, the public relations people within the palace, the communications people, the secretaries, that whole layer of uh, bureaucrats, of men in gray, the firm, had made sure that both Diana and Nutmeg were getting the most favorable publicity they could in the early stages of their relationships with members of the royal family. In Diana's case, it was with Charles. In Nutmeg's case, it was with the sock puppets. They made sure that press was very favorable, very flattering. These were fairy tale romances, and the palace went out of their way to sell that to the media on every possible level at every possible opportunity. In Diana's case, it meant the media never pulled apart her complete lack of qualifications to step into the role of Princess of Wales. This is a girl who flunked out of high school, frankly. And they would say, oh, she's a kindergarten teacher. No, she was a daycare aide. She was, you know, she was a nanny. Well, yes, they did mention that she was a nanny. They didn't mention that she worked cleaning houses, that she was not capable of any employment except the lowest and most menial types of work. Um, the kind of work that here in the U.S. we tend to associate with illegal immigrants who can't find any better work because they don't have the necessary documents. So, yes, she was doing the jobs of an undocumented alien. No one took a look at that. No one was calling that out. You just didn't hear anybody making reference to that. No, no. In fact, she was a kindergarten teacher. A, a job, by the way, that does require some post-secondary education. Period. No, she wasn't. They protected her from that. Just as the British press protected Nutmeg from all of the stories that subsequently came out uh, about her past. You know, let's face it, she was married, divorced, living with someone, 
Um, there's a lot of stuff in her past that could easily have come out. And we all have our own suspicions of how much is still out there buried, still has not yet come to light. But nevertheless, they were both protected by the palace staff. That protection didn't start to evaporate until they separated themselves. And actually, um, I would say it's safe to say that each in her own way declared war on the royal family through the media. Uh, with Diana, it was the Bashir interview. With Nutmeg, it was the Oprah interview. Those were the points at which the protection began to sort of disappear. The problem with Nutmeg's view, of course, is that she had a very a sort of fantasy-laden view of how much protection she was supposed to be getting. And her view of protection was the palace was out it was their job to keep her personal reputation spotless and sterling. They should have quashed any negative stories about her, true or not true. Very, very much a fantasy view. With Diana, interestingly enough, if she had retained the very literal protection the palace offered, but she rejected. Who knows? She probably would not have been in that Paris tunnel that night. Hard to say. Um, and, you know, I, I don't really want to second guess that, but it's extremely unlikely that legitimate British security officers would have ever let her get into a car with a drunk driver. Seems extremely unlikely to me. Nevertheless, that was a, like a shared belief the two of them had that the firm, the men in gray, were out to get them. And in fact, it's really not true. If you look at the situation objectively, they were very, very protected. And it's when they moved away from that protection, when they began spitting it back in the face of the palace. In both cases, this is when the trouble started. So I would throw those out as the three chief ways in which these two women were alike. Again, alike but different. Um, oh, and just a bonus, let me just throw out a number four because I can do this in 30 seconds. Apparently, Diana was just as obsessed with her public image as Nutmeg, only Diana never really attempted to um, control the narrative. But she would obsessively look for her name in every newspaper, every magazine. They say that if Diana's name showed up in print, she knew about it. She was reading that article. And of course, we know the same is true of Nutmeg. So that's my bonus number four. So that's what I, I've been sort of taking a look at for the last few days. What are the ways in which they are similar what are the ways in which they are different? And I would say that even in their similarities, there are differences. But they did have some surprising similarities. So we've got a comment section down at the bottom. Why don't you all tell me what you think their major similarities are, major differences? And so we've got a comment section that belongs to you. So let me know. I will be looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Now, that's what I have for you today. I will see you all again on Sunday for our next installment of Just Chatting. Meantime, we're going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out. So have a pleasant day.